read from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have been. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no help. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Let's bow in prayer. God our Father, we praise you. We put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. For you are the creator God who made heaven and earth. You are the one who has all power and might. You are the covenant God and you love your people and you keep your promises and you love justice and you care for the poor and the needy. You are worthy of praise And we praise you this day and we will do so as long as we live. Father God, even as we bow before you in this way and praise you in these terms, we must also confess that we've foolishly put our trust in our frail fellow human beings who regularly let us down And so often we think that we can manage quite well on our own with our own resources. Forgive our foolish pride, our misplaced confidence in things that we can see and touch. Thank you for Jesus and that his death for us covers these kind of faults too. Lord, not only forgive, but refresh our faith and help us to keep our eyes on you and those things that are eternal. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Let's uh, take up our hymn books and we're going to sing hymn number 21, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
On behalf, <coughs> pardon me, on behalf of the session, I would give a warm welcome to you all uh, this morning, and particularly to our visiting uh, uh, preacher this morning. Again, we give you a warm welcome, Greg. Uh, also, uh, we give a warm welcome to those in Streamland, and I believe uh, uh, Graham is in Streamland at the moment, um, uh, watching our service. So we give Graham a warm welcome, and just to fit you in, he's in uh, in quarantine at the moment, uh, which he has to do for a fortnight, seeing his uh, left the. Uh, shall we say, the dangerous state, and is now um, uh, uh, in Melbourne. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, also, um, I usually extend... Um, birthday greetings to the young ladies when uh, we hear of a um, uh, of a, one of the birthdays and uh, uh, one of our uh, young ladies that is uh, uh, just above 21 years of age I think that she's entering the golden years of her life so Irene we give you uh, a birthday greeting for yesterday so, uh, uh, and also I'd like you to take notice that next Wednesday will be our uh, uh, prayer meeting at, um, at 1.30 and next Sunday, uh, as Greg said, it'll be his um, swan song. Uh, hopefully not for very long, but by the same token, uh, we're hoping that uh, a fortnight to today uh, Graham will be returning to the pulpit. So um, I don't. Uh, I'm a bit disturbed when Will arrived there today with a with a crutch. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, already. <laughs> the. Uh, oh, I had mine with ten years ago, and I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit, <laughs> little bit older than you. But uh, <laughs> you're, oh, you're getting an early. So, um, while we're talking about the health of um, the congregation, uh, I'd just like to mention that I spoke with um, Marge yesterday, and she's coming along well after the operation, and she's, um, although she's feeling a little bit uh, weak. She's progressing satisfactorily. So uh, with that, all that, shall we say, hilarity, uh, you'll now be waited upon for your free will offering.
God, our Father, we thank you for the many ways in which you have helped us. Lord, may these gifts also help and assist others as they're invested in your kingdom work. And we pray this through Jesus. Amen. We're going to uh, have our Old Testament reading from Hosea chapter 1. The um, Old Testament reading is from Hosea chapter 1, reading the whole chapter. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits great harlotry by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Dibleim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name not pitied, for I will no more have pity on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have pity on the house of Judah, and I will deliver them by the Lord their God. I will not deliver them by bow, nor by sword, nor by war, nor by horses, nor by horsemen. When she had weaned not pitied, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, Call his name, not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Sons of the living God. And the people of Judah and the people of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Well, we're living living in a time, aren't we, where... where, uh uh, parents give their children sometimes strange names, don't they? So uh, uh, theological students sometimes think they've got to find some obscure name from the Old Testament to name their daughter or their son. I think one of the students this year, uh, his wife had a baby and uh, it's, so it's Zechariah. So, uh, so there you go. And, uh, but also you don't want to be the children of a prophet. <laughs> If you remember from Isaiah chapter 7 uh, and 8, um, Isaiah's children have strange names. Uh, Hosea, in this chapter, children have same names, strange names, names which have a kind of a meaning. You know, there's like a sermon or something contained in the name. And here are a couple of the uh, children of Hosea. One is called Not Pitied. Fancy having to go through life with a name like that. Or, and uh, a son who is called not my people. So uh, uh, again, that's a bit of a, a burden to carry through life, isn't there? But the, the, na- the names are, are a message, aren't they? They're, they're, they're a sermon. So, so my advice, uh, choose your parents carefully, or you might end up with very strange names. Uh, the message here being, isn't it, that uh, Israel, well, Israel, they are the people of God, but they're not acting like it. 
and they're facing God's judgment. And in fact, the, the covenant relationship is under threat here because of the sin of God's people. And so, you know, the message, the sermon in the name, uh, not my people. Well, the, the sermon, the message of us, of course, is, well, it's no use, you know, claiming to be the people of God if we're not living like the people of God. So that's the application for us, isn't it? Make sure that we're not only, we not only say we're following Jesus, but let's live in such a way that it's awfully obvious to everybody else, yes, that we're living for Jesus Christ. That's the, the message here. Well, let's uh, again bow in prayer. Yes, God, our Father, we thank you for the message that comes to us through the scriptures. And thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit, enabling us to understand and discern spiritual things uh, such that we understand, we believe, and with your help we act on the things that we find in Holy Scripture, the Bible. And thank you for uh, the way that uh, every passage of Scripture, one way or another, speaks of your love for us. You, the Creator, who made us in such a way that we are made in your image, we're able to relate to you in a, in a personal way. We can understand your message and, and we can speak back to you in prayer. And Father, thank you that, yes, the prophets speak about judgment, but they also contain the message that we're still loved even when we strayed. And thank you for that love you showed in sending your son, Jesus Christ, to bring us back to you. Thank you that you love the world so much that you gave your only son that if we believe in him, we will not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for that message of love that we have heard. And it's a message of love for us to tell others the most joyous news of all. And Lord, we thank you for the millions upon millions of people who have heard and believed that message. And, and know your salvation and are living for you. Thank you too for the message of the Bible that we're to love our neighbour as ourselves. And, and Father, an important part of that love is to pray for others and then to follow up our prayers with practical help as and when we can. But Lord, we pray for those who need the help that you alone can provide. We think of our political leaders facing crises and difficulties so great and complex that they obviously cannot sort these things out unaided by you. And so we pray for our political leaders on a state level and on a federal level. Lord, we pray for those who have the joy of being parents, but then also the challenge of bringing up and training up children. We pray for all who have the responsibility of teaching and guiding the young. We pray for those who care for the aged, the sick and those with disabilities. We pray for our scientists and researchers who are trying to discover things that will, can be of benefit to the human race. We pray for those with gifts of organisation and financial management uh, and those gifts which are needed in, in a world which has become so interdependent, a global village, so that what happens in one place quickly affects all other places too. Father, we pray for those who perhaps don't need, not realise that they need your help. Lord, we pray too for your people. We pray particularly for the persecuted church in different parts of the world. A and for the church in our own land, not persecuted, but tempted to bend and just fit in with prevailing social attitudes. Lord, help us to be 
intelligent and faithful as we seek to be disciples of Jesus in our daily lives. All these things we pray in and through your Son, Jesus, praying to the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Alistair's going to come and bring us our reading. And sorry it's so short, Alistair. It'll, it'll take longer to walk out the front and walk back than it will be to actually do the reading. But, but these are important words <laughs> from uh, Matthew chapter 12. So thank you. Morning all. Matthew 12, verse 46 to 50, at the end of the chapter. So it's just a wee reading. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Amen, and may God bless unto us the reading of his holy word. Well, it should be a short sermon this morning, shouldn't it? Because we've only got a few Bible verses there. But uh, before that happens, uh, let's uh, take up our hymn book and we're going to sing the hymn number uh, 435, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Yes, Father, prone to wander, 
We confess that and we pray that you might use your word today to to bring us back on track, our thinking, our lives. And we pray this through Jesus. Amen. We've been uh, having this little series in the sermons on deciding for Jesus. Jesus who loves to put people on the spot. Uh, But who do you say that I am? Will you also go away? Do you say that or is it only what other people are saying? So we've looked at a few Bible passages in which Jesus is doing this. He's challenging people. Uh, Where do they stand? What, What response will they make to Jesus Christ. Well, uh, here in our passage this morning, uh, Jesus in his own way is doing this again. So let me take you to Matthew chapter 11 and from verse 46. Uh, The scene here, we have Jesus and his disciples. I I imagine them kind of sitting fairly close to him and then behind them, a house filled with people. Outside the house, uh, the mother of Jesus and his brothers come to fetch him. The message is sent in. Uh, They're wanting uh, Jesus. And then in response, we have this extraordinary question by Jesus in verse 48. And I have no doubt that it's because of verse 48, this question, that these things were remembered, recorded, and this is available to us this morning to look at and to learn from. What does Jesus say? But he replied to the man who told told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? This extraordinary question by Jesus. So what's happening here? Yes, uh, Jesus in the house. Uh, At the beginning of the next chapter, verse 13, we're told the same day Jesus went out of the house, sat by the sea. So here he is in a house. Uh, The house is filled with people. And uh, so if the mother and brother of Jesus want to get to Jesus, they've got to send a message in and hopefully Jesus will come out to them. But the response of Jesus, who is my mother? And, And who are my brothers? I don't believe there was ever a person who said so many extraordinary things. No one matches Jesus. Uh, you used to buy. You used to be able to buy these books. No, it's all on the internet these days. But you used to be able to buy these books of, of quotations, and uh, you know some extraordinary quotations, and they're always interesting. Well, well, Jesus is the most quotable person in history. Now, other people, of course, are famous for their quotable quotes. Oscar Wilde or a Christian version, G.K. Chesterton, who were just really good at saying striking things. So there's always lots of quotations by Oscar Wilde and, I hope, G.K. Chesterton in books of quotations. But you could fill books just with the quotations of Jesus. He was so often saying extraordinary things. Well, this is one of the extraordinary things. A quotation of Jesus, who is my brother and who, so who is my mother and who are my brothers? Uh, uh, To start with, it almost sounds rude, doesn't it? But we would never accuse Jesus of rudeness. It's almost like a dismissive question. Brother? Mother? Do 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 I have a mother? Do I have a brother? He seems to be denying The connection here. Why would Jesus say such an extraordinary thing? Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Well, he's he's saying this in a very kind of dramatic way to make the point, a very important point, uh, is that he's not going to let natural ties and social relationships determine what he does. Rather, it is the love and will of his heavenly Father. That's what explains who Jesus is and what he does. It's his connection to his Father, his Father in heaven, not his natural family. Well, there's uh, other quite well-known passages of, of Scripture that make clear, of course, 
his uh, love and devotion to his mother and his brothers. Uh, the most famous one would be, of course, in, in John 9, chapter 19. So we're not going to be able to accuse Jesus of being unconcerned uh, about his uh, human family. Jesus on the cross, uh, John 19, and we remember how he made provision for his mother. I'm reading from verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. So here is Jesus concerned that his mother would be provided for and he places his mother in the care of the disciple whom he loved. We believe the apostle John. But it's interesting, isn't it, that he doesn't commit his mother to uh, the family the family of, of Joseph and his stepfather Joseph, but he commits uh, his mother's care to a disciple who now becomes the son of Mary, in effect, because this disciple John, as we believe, is the brother of Jesus. So even as he's providing for his mother, he's, he, he's again redefining family relationships. That the family of Jesus is not the physical family that he might be connected to. But he does care for his mother. And don't forget we have just that little snippet in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when, when we're reminded of the different people that the risen Christ appeared to and it says, and he appeared to James. James, who was one of his half-brothers. So we're not going to be able to accuse Jesus of being uncaring or thoughtless about his mother and his brothers, but it's the father connection which explains who Jesus is, and that's the point he's making in this extraordinary question, who is my mother and who are my brothers? We have to turn to the next chapter of Matthew 13 to see people again making a mistake in this area. The last paragraph in Matthew 13, where Jesus goes back to Nazareth, his hometown, and the people amongst whom he grew up did not react well to him. What's the problem? Let me quote. Uh, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Uh, where then did this man get all this. See, the, the people of Nazareth couldn't work out Jesus Christ. In fact, they took offence at what he was saying and doing because they were trying to understand him in terms of his human family. His mother, his brothers, and uh, added to that, sisters. Now, we're not going to understand Jesus if we just think about him as the son of Mary or the half-brother of James but it's the will of God, his father. It's the father connection that explains Jesus. And of course, that's the point he goes on to make. Um, in verse 48, uh, 49, stretching out his hand towards the disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and mother. It's the father Connection. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He's come to earth to do the will of his Father. Not, he's not going to listen to anybody else, but the pleasure and will of the Father is everything to Jesus. So, so Jesus here is helping us to kind of think more clearly. Uh, what is our response to Jesus to be? Well, it's the will of God his Father. And what is God, God the Father's will? That we believe and follow Jesus. See, that's the important thing. Uh, it's remarkable, really, that people who are so definite and clear-headed about other things are often so muddle-headed and vague when it comes to the Christian faith. You know, people who hold down a responsible job, people who show a great deal of intelligence in other things 
can be so mixed up and wonky headed when it comes to Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus here is assisting them and us to be crystal clear. If we're going to properly understand and respond to Jesus Christ, it's the Father connection that we need to see. And what is the will of the Father of Jesus? It is that we believe and follow his Son. So let's try to be clear-headed about this. Now, another thing we notice here, don't you think it's wonderful in verse 49, what does it say? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here is my mother and my brothers, the disciples. The special connection that the disciples of Jesus have to him, his mother and his brothers brothers. That that should thrill the heart of any believer. Jesus is our older brother. He looks upon us as his mother, his brothers and his sisters. How loved and secure that should make us feel. Now, of course, even for Christians, sometimes their feelings uh, deceive them. We, we can succumb to worry or, or we can feel all alone. We can feel abandoned. Well, a passage like that is telling us, yes, our, our fears are not, and our feelings are not properly uh, representing our true situation. We are loved. We are cared for. We have an older brother who is looking down upon us and who is caring for us. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, again, it's just a little snippet, but it it is just so full of meaning. Uh, The risen Christ, as he uh, tells the the women to announce his resurrection, uh, 28 verse 10, Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. He's talking about the disciples. Go and tell my brothers. And then the last words we hear from the risen Christ, uh, and behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Isn't it a wonderful thing that we can use this family language, Jesus is, has to, is teaching us here to use this family language. How are we to view him? Yes, he's our God and saviour, of course he is. But Jesus is also our older brother. And we are his mother and his brothers and his sisters. The the Christian faith is being summed up here using this language of personal relationships. The human family is being used as an analogy, yes, for our relationship with God. He is our father. Our relationship with Jesus, he is our older brother, and also our relationship with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we think about how the gospel message is proclaimed and explained in the Bible, well, often again, it's it's simply using the language of personal relationships. We're out of relationship with God. It's, It's estrangement, it's enmity, it's guilt. What do we need? We need forgiveness. We need reconciliation. These things, these are really the language of personal relationships. And the gospel message of Jesus is how we come back into relationship with God through Jesus, through his work for us on the cross. We, we, we take that by faith and we receive all the blessings, but it's the language of personal relationships. So whatever big words ministers might sometimes use, and we're allowed to sometimes use big words, forgiveness, redemption, justification, reconciliation, sanctification, all these kind of things, when we really think about the Christian faith and the truths of the faith, we're never really talking in abstract theoretical terms. No, really the very best way 
of speaking of the faith is the personal terms that Jesus himself has provided. And indeed, in this passage, it's the language of family relationships. And um, so what could be more personal than that? And indeed, if we think of the Bible, we could put it under the heading of theology. But what's theology? It's the study of the way, the character and the ways of God and, and God who is personal. In fact, he's three persons in one. He's the tri-personal God. And through his son, he's patched up this broken relationship that we have with him through sin. And we can be restored to relationship with God through Jesus Christ. As I said, so that we have God as our father and we are the brothers of Jesus. And when, when we think of the Christian faith in those terms, doesn't it make it the most attractive message in the world? It's all about the restoration of personal relationships. Most of all with our Father God, but then of course with others as well as that relationship with God begins to have an effect on what we're like and what we're doing. Now let's look then at what really is, I suppose, the challenge also in verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mothers. When uh, Jesus says, in effect, he says by that question, you know, that, you know, who is my mother? Who, is, who are my brothers? Uh, Jesus here is not saying, well, I'm not taking any notice of anybody. He's not denying all connections. He's certainly not a free spirit. No, it's the father connection, isn't it? Not the will of his mother. Remember in John chapter 2 at the wedding, they ran out of wine and his mother tries to get him involved. And again, this is another occasion where he seems to speak quite strongly, but we should not take it as rudeness. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 2, uh, uh, verse 4, sorry, uh, Jesus said to her, to Mary, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus is simply making the point, I'm not going to do something because you asked me to. Jesus listens to his Father in heaven, you see. And then just a few pages over in chapter 7 where his brothers suggest that he go up to Jerusalem for the feast. And uh, Jesus says something similar here. Uh, Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. Both those passages use this idea of the time. Jesus is not going to be told what to do by his mother, by his brothers. His time, his timetable is set by what his father says to him. And so Jesus is someone who does the will of God his father. And so also the disciples of Jesus, those who follow Jesus, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So this, this is the family characteristic of Jesus. Of Jesus. How, how do we tell people who are in the family of Jesus? We're looking around of, are they big? Are they small? Are they tall? Are they short? What's the colour of their hair? They're not the distinguishing features, are they? We can always recognise the family of Jesus. When we come across another Christian brother or another Christian sister, we, we recognise them pretty quickly. They're those who are doing the will of the Father of Jesus. And of course, the beginning of that or the heart of that the will of God, his Father, is that we believe and follow Jesus Christ. Of course, if we're, if in, in describing Jesus as our older brother, of course, we're not putting him on our level by any means. Just as when we know that God is our Father, we're not putting ourselves on the level of Jesus. Notice here that Jesus says, my Father, whoever does the will of my Father, not our Father, my Father, there's the unique father-son relationship, a matter of being and eternity. 
Jesus, who is God the Son. So there's a, a uniqueness about that father-son relationship. But in a lesser sense, of course, through Jesus, through our connection to Jesus, God also becomes our Father. In that sense, we're invited into the family of God and the privileges that the family of God have. So doing the will of the Father of Jesus. Now, of course, Matthew in his gospel really tells us, in a sense, more of that will than any of the gospels. Remember how Matthew has these uh, big five uh, uh, um, kind of lessons or teaching by Jesus. The most famous, of course, in chapters 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount. But there are other important passages uh, too. The whole of chapter 10, which gives instructions about disciples. Uh, chapter 13, which is quite a long chapter, which has uh, uh, many of the, the parables of Jesus. Chapter 18, where Jesus talks about the community relationships of his people. Chapters 23 to 25, where Jesus talks about the future. So Matthew provides us more of the teaching of Jesus than any of the other three, to three uh, uh, Gospels. So he, he gives us a great deal of what the will of God the Father might be for us. But the heart of it, don't miss this. To miss this is to miss everything. The will of the Father of Jesus is that we believe and we follow his Son. And then Matthew gives us details. What does following mean? So here's another passage in which Jesus is challenging us to decide what is our response to him going to be. Let's pray. Yes, Father, we thank you that we have the teaching of Jesus. We have his words recorded for us here in Holy Scripture. We thank you, too, for the striking way in which our Saviour speaks. And I thank you that it kind of cuts through the, the funny ideas that we might have. It corrects our thinking and enables us to understand the truth. Lord, thank you that what Jesus says here is amazing but wonderful. That God can become our father and that he offers to be our older brother if we do the will of his father. Lord, enable each one of us to respond in the way that is being urged here, that, that each one of us will be people who believe in Jesus and then put that belief into practice in our daily lives. Lord, it's our prayer that uh, Sunday by Sunday as we gather here, here that we might receive help and encouragement and instruction as we seek to be the disciples of Jesus in a time which in many ways is so confusing and so challenging. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our Pastor Graham, who is regularly teaching us out of Holy Scripture. Thank you for our brothers and sisters who are on this same path of discipleship with us. Thank you for all the encouragement that they give us. And so we return thanks to you in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, a hymn that takes up this theme of discipleship, it's the hymn number 509, Jesus, Master, Whose I Am.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore.